All right, let's turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 in our Bibles this morning. We are continuing our, our Sunday School series on why are we Baptist? Why are we Baptist? We talked about the fact that the Bible is the authority for faith and practice, that the local church is to be autonomous, it's to make its own decisions, it's under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. The priesthood of the believer, the importance, the, the important truth that we can come to God directly. We don't need a human mediator between us, we don't need a priest or someone to confess. Need a vicar. Christ is sufficient for that. And then we are in the middle of the two ordinances. Last week we discussed the ordinance of baptism and the significance that it that it has. It's a picture of our union with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And now we have another ordinance that the Lord Jesus ordained for us to to continue until he returns. This is what the local church is supposed to do. We're going to read in verse 17 in Matthew 26. It says, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The Master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth, as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Strong words by our Savior. Yes. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. Mm -hmm. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. Father, we come before you this morning and we want to worship you in spirit and in truth through study of your word today. We want to understand your, the ordinance that you gave us of the Lord's table. I pray that you would help us to find out what the Bible says about it, how we're supposed to do it, who's supposed to be participating in it, what it stands for. Lord, show us these things and help us to explain them to those who have questions. Lord, bless our time together. We look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, these two ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper are very significant. One of them, the first one we talked about, baptism, we talked about last week, that's the picture of our union of our identification with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And we talked last week the importance that it has to be immersion because that is the best way that demonstrates, that, that shows us that we are immersed, we are, Christ died, 
was buried in the tomb and we rose again. He rose again. And baptism is a picture of us being united in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. Sprinkling doesn't do that, doesn't show that picture, nor does pouring. It's immersion. Now, we have another ordinance that the Lord Jesus gave us, and he's told us to do it until he returns, and it's the Lord's table. Now, this is the first time that Jesus did it with his disciples. First time. There are two parts of the Lord's table, or the two elements, if you will. You have the unleavened bread, and unfermented wine. And we'll ex I'll explain why has to be this specific. The unleavened bread, let's talk about that for a second. That is signifying his body. Look in verse 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now, I want to be very clear. The bread that Jesus gave to his disciples was not his literal body. That is a wrong interpretation that the Roman Catholic Church has taken concerning the Lord's table. I'll explain, to, I'll explain that later in a few minutes. The unleavened bread, it has to be unleavened. Why? Because leaven is a type or a picture of sin. We find in the Old Testament when, most, when God instituted the Passover in Exodus 12, He told them to make sure that the leaven in their house had to be gone. <coughs> All right? <coughs> Hold your finger in chapter 26. Go back to chapter 16 of Matthew. Matthew 16. This is... Another instance of leaven being pictured as a being being pictured as sin or a picture of sin. Excuse me. Let's go to verse six. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, if you know anything about Jesus and the Pharisees, they did not go very well. They didn't have a good relationship. Pharisees and Sadducees did not like our Savior. They hated Him because He spoke with authority, not as the scribes. Let's keep reading. And they reasoned among themselves, these are the disciples, saying, it is because we have taken no bread. When, which when Jesus perceived, He said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets he took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets he took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I speak it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Jesus used leaven as a picture of the false doctrine that the Pharisees and Sadducees were teaching. Interesting. Let's go to one more place. Keep your finger in Matthew 26. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. Paul uses leaven here as a picture of sin as well. Now the context here 
we find in verse 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. So the context here is that there was a man in the Corinthian church who married his stepmother. And apparently a believer, because it's saying it's among you, that there is sexual sin among you, especially this man. In verse 2, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, but that, that, ye have, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. It sounds like the Corinthian church was being very permissive when, with this sin, with this man and his sin. Verse 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. And he's very blunt about that. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump as ye are leavened. Unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. He's telling the Corinthian church, this man who's committed this sexual sin needs to be removed from your congregation. He needs to be church disciplined. Very strong, he even says in verse 5, you need to deliver him unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. What that basically means is, when we have a church discipline situation in the church, especially in the area of immorality, and they are not repentant of that sin. When you're delivering, when the church is delivering a specific believer to Satan, they are allowing Satan to have his way with this sinful human, with this sinful believer. And that's what sin does. It vexes us, it bothers us, it ruins us from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Right. And the prayer is that the, the suffering or the, the buffeting, so to speak, that Satan is using on this believer would bring this sin, sinful Christian back into fellowship with God and with the church. So leaven here is a type or a picture of sin. Then we have the unfermented wine. Well, actually, before I go there, the reason why it has to be unleavened, number one, leaven is a type of sin, but also it's signifying Jesus' body, it did not know corruption. Jesus' body was sinless. He was a sinless, the son, sinless Son of God. And if leaven is a picture of sin, the bread needs to show or be a picture that Jesus had no sin either. That's why it has to be unleavened. We find in Psalm 16, verse 10, the prophecy from David, uh, Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption or decay. Now we go to the unfermented wine. This signifies his precious blood. It has to be unfermented because, number one, I repeat, Jesus did not know corruption in death. And this is my opinion, and I think I have scripture to back this up. I don't think Jesus would have ever meant the cup of the Lord's table to be meant to have been for drunkenness or social drinking. And fermentation is a picture of corruption. Jesus, his blood was precious, sinless, nothing wrong in it. Unleavened bread and unfermented wine. These are the two things that we use for the Lord's table. The unfermented wine could be is pretty much grape juice. Any questions on that so far? Anything? Any other comments? Anybody? You have one question, Pastor? Now, how do we know that that bread was unleavened? 
How do we know that that bread was unleavened? Well, I believe it's because Jesus was using the Lord's Supper basically from the Old Testament Passover, which also used unleavened bread. Well, they were observing the Passover. Yeah. <laughs> that would be my answer. Good question. Okay. Now there are some errors that are out there about the Lord's table. And there are two main ones. Errors concerning the Lord's Supper. Now let's go back to Matthew 26. Okay, we're going to talk about this, these two. And we're going to explain why we do not hold to these errors. Number one, transubstantiation. Big word. Transubstantiation. When a Roman Catholic priest blesses the wafer and the wine when they give the Lord's table, it becomes the body and blood of Christ respectively. In my, in my mind, I, I like the word trans, the, the prefix in the beginning, so I think of it like all of a sudden it transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And they take that, Roman Catholicism takes that from, the, from verse 26, when Jesus said in Matthew 26, take, eat, this is my body. So they take that literally, that this literally is the body and blood of Christ. There are three main problems for, with that, though. Okay? Number one, let's be real about this. Jesus' body, when he was administering the Lord's table here in Matthew 26, was intact. He didn't shed his blood, and his body wasn't broken yet. That's important. So how could it be his body and blood if he didn't die yet? Number two, all throughout the Gospels, we, we find Jesus using figures of speech, such as metaphors and similes. Jesus used them a lot, especially in Matthew. You find all throughout Matthew when he talks about the kingdom of heaven, and he uses a picture. The kingdom of heaven is like, un, like an unto for example, in Matthew 13, about the pearl of great price, there's a treasure out in the field that's dug, and a man wants to buy this field so that he can find that treasure. And there are many, many more. The kingdom of heaven is like unto the four soils, for example, that describe the four different kinds of people and how they respond to truth. So Jesus here, I believe he's using a metaphor this is my body. Metaphors are when you do not use like, the word like or as, but it's still a picture or a comparison. Can you and, give us an example? Sorry? Can you give us an example? An example of a metaphor? My love and the red red rose. Yes. <laughs> Here, let me give you an example. My wife is a beautiful red rose. I am not using the word like or as there with this, but it's a comparison. I'm comparing her beauty to a red rose without thorns. Anyway, we will. No, you can't have it all. <laughs> <laughs> now, number three. Now, this is very important. This is the third point. This is blasphemous to say that the bread and the juice are actually the body, the body and blood of Christ. Why? Why is this blasphemous? Because you're saying that Christ's once for all sacrifice isn't enough. And that he has to continually sacrifice himself for our sins. If this is still his body and this is truly his blood, that means he's still dying. 
or he still needs to give up his life on the cross. That's blasphemous. To say that our Savior, his atoning death on the cross was not enough, is blasphemy. Because if that's the case, we actually have no hope of heaven if that's the, if that's the truth. Correct. It has to, had to be once for all. We find in Hebrews 10 that it was once for all. When he said it is finished, he meant it is finished. And I ask a lot of unsaved people this question when I give the gospel. If Jesus says your sin debt is finished, is there anything else that you need to pay? The answer is no. Nothing else other, other than just trusting him. Trust his finished work. Now there's a second error called consubstantiation. This is uh, something that a lot of the Lutheran churches today hold when it comes to the Lord's table. Something very similar to transubstantiation, but a little different. With this, it's the literal bread and the literal body of Christ coexisting. So, the bread and the juice have with it the body and blood of Christ respectfully. Respectively. This is also an error. You do not find that in Scripture. Again, emphasizing the idea that if this is or it has the body and blood of Christ in it, it's showing that he has to die again and he's still being sacrificed, and that's blasphemous. So those are the two errors. Again, Roman Catholicism holds transubstantiation. Lutherans hold to consubstantiation. As a Baptist church, we hold to neither. I'll show you what we hold to, hold to in the Bible. Any questions here in this part? You have a question, Pastor? Where is it? 
Uh, is every Catholic, is there, you know they're Catholic, they go to Mass every day. Are those wafers potting up in there? You know, when they, when they have the surgery done, they, does the surgeon find a whole stack of um, wafers in there? Of course he does that. Hmm. I appreciate that, thank you. Yeah. Something I always thought on as a kid, because if transubstantiation is true, that mm -hmm. makes us all cannibals. Well, you go back to John chapter 6. <laughs> That's another thing. And he says, Jesus said, The words that I speak in you, their spirit and their life. life. The flesh profit is nothing. And you see, mm -hmm. by, by the way, you will find this very, very commonly. Heretics make literal what should be figurative, and they make figurative what should be literal. Because they have no spiritual insight. Mm -hmm. They, and, and, and it's, it's actually almost funny. It's almost funny because they just get it wrong almost every time. I mean, how, how you know, you'd think they could get it wrong 50% of the time. They get it wrong almost every time. One two choices, you ought to get right. Yes. All right. Let's continue. Let's go to First Corinthians eleven now, and we're going to spend the rest of our time here. First Corinthians eleven. Now we talked about the elements of the Lord's table: the unleavened bread and the unfermented wine also considered grape juice. The errors, we talked about the different um, errors that are out there concerning it uh, and why they're out there. Now I want to talk about the purpose of the Lord's table. Why do we do it? Have you ever thought about that? Why we do it? Well, obviously, Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me, verse 24, Paul's quoting the Lord Jesus here. Let's start there. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. If you have a pen, I would recommend circling the word remembrance or underlining, because that's very important. Number one, the reason, one reason why, obviously, Jesus commanded it of us to do it is remembrance. Remembrance. In remembrance, that phrase there, verse 24, it tells us that the Lord's Supper is a memorial to remind us of our Savior's suffering for us on the cross. The word memorial is very important. Have you ever thought of why we celebrate Memorial Day on the last Monday of every May? To remember the men and women who have given their lives for our country over our, all of the wars of history, of our history. We take time to think about their sacrifice. Well, the Lord's table reminds us that our Savior gave His own life for us on the cross. Amen. His sinless life. Because mm -hmm. His sacrifice satisfied the wrath of God on our behalf. Mm -hmm. Now, the word in remembrance also emphasizes that there's symbolism in the bread and the, in the bread and in the juice. They neither are or contain the body and blood of Christ. And number three, this demonstrates that there is no saving grace that's imparted when one takes of the bread and the juice. 
purpose of the Lord's Supper is not salvation or earning grace from God. It's a memorial to remind us of what He did. Number two. Testimony. Testimony. Go to verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now, showing the Lord's death, number one, is giving testimony that we have been born again. Only believers can take partake of the Lord's table. But also, I found this very interesting. Showing the Lord's death. Paul Jackson wrote a book called The Doctrine and Administration of the Church. And he gave the idea that this is to be a life-size object lesson of the significance of Christ's death. And the reason why he said that was because he gave testimony of seeing people come to Christ while after watching believers take the Lord's table. Because of all of, this, of all of the types, all the pictures that we find in the Lord's table of His sinless, broken body and His precious blood that He shed for us on the cross and how significant this is and how we, have to, how we are to remind ourselves of this often, often, they got saved when they saw it. This is something very, very significant. Number three, self-examination. Self-examination. Let's keep reading. Let's go to verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Self-examination. Paul warned the Corinthian church of partaking the Lord's Supper unworthily. The word unworthily, two, two definitions I think of. Number one, it's not literal definitions, but it means you're taking the Lord's Supper uh, half-heartedly, not really thinking through what this means, why are we doing it, and also... Living in sin, you are taking the Lord's Supper while living in known sin. And Paul gives a very strict warning here because in verse 30 he says to the church, the Corinthian church, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. There were some Christians in the Corinthian church that were taking the Lord's table while living in known sin, and it led them to some to get sick, and some of them died. Don't you think that this is a very serious thing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, self-examination, you know what we should do when we take the Lord's table? So that we don't take it unworthily? Before we take it, I think we should pray and ask the Lord to search our hearts of any unconfessed sin. Of any sin that we've done or any, any known sin, any harboring of sin that we've done, whether it be bitterness with a fellow Christian. 
I think I've heard of stories of, Lord, of the Lord's table being given. One believer was under conviction because he was bitter with another believer in the same church. And that believer tapped that other brother in the, in the, in the shoulder and said, hey, can we talk him about it? And they got right. <laughs> they got right with each other. Bitterness, or watching something we shouldn't be watching, or we are giving time to things that we love that put God lower in the totem pole. We spend more time with our idols than with God. Or we've been selfish. We've been thinking all about ourselves lately. Any unconfessed sin should be confessed to the Lord before the Lord's table. I think Lord's, the Lord's Supper, if we really think about it, could be a revival time. Because if we are getting right with God, and then after that we're showing the Lord how much we love Him in the Lord's table. And lastly, it reminds us of His coming. Remind us of the Lord's coming. And I take that from verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He come. It's a picture again of His death on the cross for us, right? But it also is reminding us that this same Savior who died for us rose again and he's coming again for us. And it brings us back to the truth that we find all throughout the New Testament of being prepared to meet him. Little children, abide in him that when he shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. 1 John 2.28 reminds us of his coming. Any questions on this part? Anything? Any questions you have on why we take the Lord's table? Okay. Now, last point. Let's spend just a few minutes here. The people. Who are to be the partakers? Who are the ones that can participate? Well, the, the Bible gives some essentially essential requirements. Number one, a salvation testimony. A salvation testimony. The Lord's table was given to the church, which is an, a called out assembly of people who have been born again. Who've been born again. So number one, a salvation testimony. Now, of course, number two, not living in known sin. Do not take the Lord's table unworthily in known sin. Now, this is my view. I don't find any scriptural rule on this, but it makes sense. you need to be baptized to take the Lord's table. Here's why I say this. We find in the Great Commission, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Baptism is very, very was pronounced in Jesus when Jesus said the Great Commission. What would follow would be the Lord's table, would follow all of the, of the truth that we find in the Scripture. Because you have your union with Christ first, you got saved, you are now in union with Him, and baptism is a picture of that union with Christ. 
Then after that comes our communion or our fellowship with him. That's what the, Lord, the Lord's table um, signifies as well. Reminding us that it needs to be uh, done often. That is my view. I'm sure some would disagree with me. That's perfectly fine. One thing, um, Go ahead. as a child, of course I was brought up in a Christian home, I realize everybody isn't. I realize that. But like, since I was in church every day and I saw I know my dad said that I couldn't take communion until I was baptized. But the, it's more than just that. As, I'm talking about children now, not adults. It's sure. the symbolism. Like there's a certain age that you don't really understand mm -hmm. all the symbolism. So, um, but, but that was one of the things that my dad said. That you, okay. you can't, and and also, to me, it's an act of obedience. And when you take communion, you're, you're showing that cleansing your heart that you're obedient and mm -hmm. so that is one of the steps mm -hmm. of obedience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You had a question? You had a comment to make? Um, one of the things that's kind of a thread that runs through so many things as it relates to church and um, well for example church discipline here even in the Old Testament said if I regard it in my heart the Lord will not hear me. It's not the sin. It's the refusal to repent of the sin. If, if you go back and you look at church discipline, it may start out as a, as a very small thing. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, why would you throw a person out of your church just because they did such and such? That's not the issue at all. And it's the same with baptism mm -hmm. uh, before communion. Why not? Why are you? Why do you, do you not get baptized? God said, get baptized. Until you are obedient, until you repent, and repentance includes, I think, I think it's very, very safe to say that a, a re true repentance presupposes subsequent obedience. Mm -hmm. All right, and so until you do that, you're 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 you have not repented. Mm -hmm. Now, I I wouldn't have a big problem if a person got saved, and next the next Sunday they took communion because they aren't disobedient. But at, a, at some point, they, they are disobedient because they don't, they don't do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you know we, we, as Baptists, and I as well, right. as Baptists, we kind of look down on, on, on many things relative to the Catholic Church. But I think there's one thing that they do, that, and I, I think they get carried, carried away with it, but I think maybe we could take a, a little lesson from when children have first communion, they have classes they, they learn about. Mm. I don't think people should take communion in ignorance. Mm. So I don't even know exactly where we go with it. Yeah. Good, no, good, very, very good point. And I think, too, like, it's very specific that you examine yourself. It's not like the pastor says you can't do this, you can't do that. It's right. the person examines yes. themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's the light that they have is between them and God. But I mean, of course, the pastor has to teach them. Sure. You know, yeah. I could, I can't, you know, Pastor Christopher or myself, we can't tell somebody in the back row, oh, you can't take this because of X, Y, and Z. Right, right, right. So now, the question would be, could we say that if they were under church discipline? That's for another discussion. I would, <laughs> I would lean more on the... I mean, you know, I... Or, I don't know, actually, well, because well, in a way, no, you know, in a way you can, in a way you can't, because I believe at that point, if a, if a if a disciplined Christian is in the audience and he's taking the Lord's table, he's doing he's doing it. I think full well knowing what is what could happen to him. Well, I think it would be wise for the pastor in in the proceeding up to the point where the elements offered to let that be done. I mean, you don't have to point the person out, right. but you, you have to say, you know, if you are, look, look what the scriptures, you know, maybe, maybe you wouldn't do that every every time it's done, mm -hmm. but when you have someone there that's, you know, really should. Mm -hmm. You know what? Here's the other thing, because we talked about individual soul liberty. Yes. 
So I take that's so I think there is scriptural ground that would that would lead us to the conclusion. If you disagree with me, that's fine. But I think it's fair to say, unless they are new believers, they just got saved two days ago, for example. If there's a Christian that is not baptized or is unwilling to be baptized shouldn't take the Lord's table. Good discussion. Very, very good discussion. Let's close in a word of prayer and we'll get ready for the morning service. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the Lord's table. Thank you that you commanded us to take it often to remind us of your suffering on the cross for our sin. You were the perfect sacrifice. Lord, nothing else could do. Lord, the blood of bulls and goats could not do it, but your precious son, his life was given for us, and we're so grateful that he did. And Lord, it reminds us also that he will one day return, and he will take us to be with him. Amen. We look forward to that day. Lord Jesus, I pray, Lord, when we take the Lord's table, that we would examine our hearts before you, and confess any known sin so we may freely take of the Lord's table on, so that we won't do it unworthily. And Lord, if there's any Christian out there that's not being obedient, whether it be disobedience in baptism or living in sin, I pray, Lord, that you would work in their hearts and bring them back to yourself, that they would see the error of their way and, Lord, receive them back to you as you always do. Lord, prepare us for the morning service to come. We want to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.